Well, good evening, everyone. For those I've not had the chance to meet, my name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of this wonderful place, the Reagan Foundation, and I want to thank all of you for joining us here this evening. In honor of our men and women in uniform who protect our freedom around the world, if you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started, we have a few special guests in the audience I'd like to make sure that we recognize this evening. And of course, I'd like to uh, start with Dr. Carson's lovely wife, Candy. Candy. <laughs> Seated right next to Candy is our former and illustrious Congressman Elton Galgalene, his wife, Janice. We have several local officials with us tonight, including Mark Lunn, Bob Huber, Mike Judge, Keith Mashburn, and Dennis Weber. You all, please stand. Thank you. And finally, there's a couple here, Al Frank with his wife, Denise, and I want to point them out because they are just two of the extraordinary benefactors who make programs like this possible. Al, Denise, thank you. First, let me say that I am honored to introduce our special guest this evening, whose courageous forthright ideas have caught America's attention. How so? Well, for one, there is already a website called runbenrun.com. And it is hosted by a group of people that intends to relocate our guests to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in 2016. Now what they and others, I believe, are witnessing is the power of what I will call the Ben Carson phenomena, the power of ideas to turn the tide of history. If you look back just 50 years, you can see how great ideas like those of our guests actually made a difference. 50 years ago, a union guy in California, an actor, not a politician, who held conservative ideas and was pretty good at expressing them, brought Americans together with a common purpose. He explained that the birth of the great society delivered only a welfare state and a weakened, indebted nation. The power of his ideas took him first to Sacramento, and by 1980, Ronald Reagan took the White House. Now today, some may look at the political glass we face as half empty. You may believe there's no antidote for what progressive politics coming out of the White House day after day are bringing us. But you know, and I know, there's nothing stronger than sound ideas to upset the balance of power. And a man who is putting out great, logical, sound ideas is with us tonight. He offers a common sense critique of liberal government. He calls for a return to our historic culture of personal responsibility, free markets, and upward mobility. With a staunch belief in the integrity of the U.S. Constitution, he rocked the National Prayer Breakfast twice. <laughs> Dr. Ben Carson's fearless and direct approach to honest politics is not only refreshing, but urgently needed. At his side for almost 40 years, he and his wife, Candy, solidified their ideas with a plan of action 
in their book, One Nation. At the end of each chapter, there's a list of eye-opening action steps. For example, politely disagree with someone who makes a political statement that's different from yours, but then respectfully just discuss your differences. Now what I learned from One Nation is that Ben Carson does not want to move our nation to the right or the left, but rather to move it up with all of us together. It's a straightforward, inspired work that is sure conservative politics can make a comeback. With a man who's, not a, who's, a, man who's a doctor and not a politician, a man who learned how to heal the body and is now prepared to tackle the challenge of healing the soul of a nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Carson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, Candy and I are absolutely uh, delighted and honored to be here in the uh, Ronald Reagan Library. Uh, Ronald Reagan was somebody who had a profound influence on my life uh, because uh, having grown up in uh, inner city Detroit and Boston, uh, by the time I reached the age of majority, I was a radical left-wing Democrat. <laughs> um, as most young people were, you know, back in those days. Uh, but I remember listening to Reagan's speeches and they made so much sense. I mean, it was just nothing esoteric whatsoever, just common sense. And that coupled with the fact that I was in medical school at that time and I was starting to, actually I was in my residency and I was starting to see the results of what happens in people's lives when they don't take responsibility. And it was a combination of those two things that, that really altered my political thinking very dramatically. But you know, as a youngster, the only thing that really interested me was medicine. I loved anything that had to do with medicine. You know, Dr. Kildare, Dr. Casey, all of those <laughs> kinds of stuff. Uh, anything on radio or television about medicine, I was right there like a magnet. And I even liked going to the doctor's office, so that tells you <laughs> that I was kind of a strange person. And, going to the hospital was like the best thing in the world because, you know, most people get irritated and they say, my time's important to I'm sitting there waiting for these doctors. But I love waiting for the doctors. I would sit out in the hallway and listen to the PA system, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones, to the emergency room, Dr. Johnson to the clinic. They sounded so important. And uh, I would be thinking one day, they'll be saying, Dr. Carson, Dr. Carson. But of course, now we have beepers, so you still don't get to hear it. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, sometimes those, those dreams are the things that drive you. I think that's the reason that God gave us brains with the ability to dream, to sustain you during times of peril and disappointment. But sometimes dreams don't lead to good places, and I'm sure some of you remember the case of the Bijani twins, the 29-year-old Iranian women who were joined at the head. Their lifelong dream was to be separated. They scoured the planet looking for a team that would be willing to take on that kind of risk. Everybody agreed that there was no better than a 50-50 chance of them surviving such an operation. When I was first contacted about their case, you know, I, I told them about Chang and Ng Bunker, the original Siamese twins who lived until they were 63 years old. Uh, but they didn't want to hear about that. And they kept searching until they found a team that was willing to do it in Singapore. And they had 
actually separated a set of twins from Nepal some years earlier. I was actually involved in that case, so they managed to convince me to come and join them against my better judgment. But I, when I met those young ladies, I was duly impressed. They were full of personality, vivacious, smart, had learned to speak English in only seven months, if you can imagine that. They both had college degrees. They both had law degrees. Only one wanted one, but they both had law degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so they had a very good impression of the risks that they were undertaking. And they said something to me that really struck me. They said, Doctor, we would rather die than spend another day stuck together. And that seemed kind of harsh to me, but then I did something that I highly recommend to everybody. I put myself in their shoes. I said, what would it be like to be stuck to somebody 24-7. Couldn't get away from them for one second. It could be the person you like the most in the whole world. How long would you like them for? And I began to realize what they were feeling. Well, you know, that uh, operation proceeded. We were in the third day. We were about 90% finished. Some people were starting to celebrate. I was not among them. Because when we got to the very last part of the operation, they started bleeding. Under such pressure, you couldn't stop it. You'd put a clip on it, and it would rupture behind the clip. And another clip, and it would rupture, and it kept rupturing, and they died. So not everything that we do is successful. But interestingly enough, if you look throughout the history of surgery, you find a lot of failure that eventually leads to success. The first kidney transplants, horrible, disastrous. The same thing with heart, lungs, livers, transplanting them, horrendous. You would have said, why did they even bother? But every time there was a failure, information was gathered. Things were learned. And now all of those things can be done quite routinely. And it's a general principle Learning from things that don't work, learning from mistakes, is what wise people do. And it's not just in medicine. Thomas Edison said he knew 999 ways a light bulb did not work. You know, <laughs> he learned. The cleaning formula 409. Why do they call it that? The first 408 didn't work, you know? <laughs> so, but you learn, you keep learning, and pretty soon you have success. Walter Dandy, the famous neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins many decades ago, First one to try all kinds of things, including operating on the posterior fossa. People said that compartment of the head is too small, the tissue will swell, the patient will die. He operated on someone with a lesion, the posterior fossa. The tissue did swell, the patient did die. And he operated on another, and they died, and another, and they died. The first 13 all died. Can you imagine how discouraged he was? I can't even imagine what he said to the 14th patient when they asked how the other 13. <laughs> probably said nobody's complaining, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is he persisted and now we're able to do posterior fossa operations quite routinely and quite safely. And it is such an important concept because it also applies to nations. If you can learn from bad things that happen to other nations, you know, we have many other pinnacle nations that preceded us. And we can look at what they did. And we could learn from it. And we could avoid similar mistakes. But it's almost as if we do read it and then we say, yep, that's what we're supposed to do next, to make sure we also go down the tubes. And uh, <laughs> you know, at some point, wisdom has to prevail. And you have to recognize, you know, the, the, the Spaniards didn't recognize in the 17th century that they would destroy themselves through fiscal irresponsibility. The French didn't realize that in the 18th century. The ancient Romans didn't realize that about themselves. Great Britain didn't realize that they were gonna overextend themselves. And we don't seem to be able to learn from all of those examples. 
But I have faith that somehow, at some point, we will. Because Thomas Jefferson said that our system was set up in such a way that when things got to the point where they were utterly ridiculous, that the people would respond. It's time for the people to respond because things are utterly ridiculous at this point. Now, you may have noticed, but in case you have not, I am not politically correct. And I have no intention of ever being politically correct. I think political correctness is one of the worst gorges that ever visit our shores. And it's antithetical to founding principles of this nation, freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And I think our founders would turn over in their grave if they could see how we were being beaten down and how we were afraid to actually talk about what we believe. But it's part of a larger plan, a larger plan to silence us. Rule number one in Saul Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, you make the majority believe that what they think is no longer fashionable, that no one with any intelligence thinks that way. And the way that you believe is the only way that any intelligent person would ever think. And if you can co-opt the media, you're far ahead in the process. Well, that's exactly what has happened. And people have grabbed the microphones and they have basically run with it. And in, you know, 30, 40 years ago, if you had told the average person in America what would be going on today, they would say, nah, you're fantasizing. That, 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 that could never be going on in America. And yet, it is. And PC is a large part of it. And we're going to have to find a way to deal with it. I've already found a way to deal with it. I ignore it. I simply don't pay attention to it. And I'm not going to pay attention to it. But you have to recognize that they, they use intimidation to gain control. And uh, they've managed to convince people that if you're pro-life, you're anti-woman. If you're pro-traditional marriage, you're a homophobe. If you're white and you oppose a progressive black person, you're a racist. If you're black and you oppose progressivism, you're crazy. So, I mean, it's just... And, and, and people respond to this and they allow themselves to be intimidated. You know, I learned about intimidation when I was a kid, eight years old, I was intimidated by dogs. I was deathly afraid of dogs. I would be late going to school because I would almost be there and then there would be a dog. And I had to go all the way around the block, then I'd get to school and then there was another dog. And I have to, you know, and it, it really was a problem. And a man told me, he said, dogs won't bother you if they don't think you're afraid of them. Just ignore them and they will absolutely not bother you. I said, are you sure about this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, I decided to test it out. There was a dog on our street named Rusty and he was a particularly nasty dog. Nobody wanted to walk down that way. But I said, I'm gonna walk down there. Rusty could not believe his eyes as I came walking <laughs> out there. And he started barking and snarling, came running out toward me. And I said, this was a mistake. <laughs> and he ran right up to my leg, sniffed it, turned around, went back to the porch. The next time I came down there, he just barked and snarled from the porch, but he didn't come off. The next time, he just lifted his head and looked at me and laid back down. And the next time, he didn't even look. Because you see, it wasn't worth his energy. If I wasn't going to respond, if I wasn't going to be afraid, why bother? And, you know, that's what I'm finding out about the secular progressive movement here, too. You know, they still like to try to twist a few things, but for the large part, 
they backed off because they can see that I'm not afraid of them. But I actually enjoy them because they're kind of humorous. You know, some, a few months ago when I said that the, the VA scandal was a blessing from God because it shows us what happens when you insinuate tons of bureaucrats between patients and healthcare providers. You know, they said, Carson said God wants veterans to die. I mean, <laughs> it's just such craziness. And then a few weeks ago when I said people shouldn't pile on Ray Rice, I said, you know, obviously what he did to his wife was wrong. And, you know, there's no excuse for that. And he should be punished for that. But we shouldn't pile, all pile on him. Like we're all the righteous ones. Because you have to apply that to everybody if you're going to do that. And what we should be understanding is that there are some disturbances here with both him and with his wife. And they need help. And you need to delve into this. And the left wing press said, Carson defends domestic abuse. You know? <laughs> just, just, I mean, it's just so absurd. I think one of the reasons that they backed off quite a bit is that they've discovered that the more they attack me, the more people like me. So uh, <laughs> it's a problem for them. I don't know what to do. But, But, you know, there were, there were a lot of problems for me realizing my dream of becoming a physician. Not the least of which were the fact that my parents got divorced early on. That was devastating. And uh, my mother was one of 24 children. We got married when she was 13. And they moved from rural Tennessee to Detroit. Uh, my father was a factory worker. And some years later, she discovered he was a bigamist, had another family. I remember telling that story at a graduation at the University of Utah. Nobody thought it was that strange. <laughs> I told you I'm not PC. <laughs> now, everybody knows they don't do that anymore, right? Okay, that was a thing of the past. But, you know, she thought it was very strange, and we ended up moving uh, to Boston to live with her older sister and brother-in-law. Uh, typical tenement, large multifamily dwelling, boarded up windows and doors, sirens, gangs, gigantic rats, aggressive roaches. And, um, but I remember as a, as a nine-year-old, sitting on the ghetto stairs, looking through the building across the street, out of which all the windows had been broken, and through which a sunbeam was shining. And it made me think about my future. And I remember thinking that it was unlikely that I would live to be more than 25 years of age, because that's what I saw around me. I remember seeing people lying on the street with bullet holes and stab wounds. Both of my older cousins, who we adored, were killed. My mother, in the meantime, was out working two, three jobs at a time, leaving at five in the morning, getting back after midnight, day after day, one job to the next. She only had a third grade education, but she was very observant. She noticed that no one she ever saw go on welfare came off of it. So she didn't want to go on it to start with. And you know, she worked very hard to stay off of it. She occasionally accepted some food stamps, but for the most part was quite successful. And she never saw herself as a victim, no matter what was going on. And she never felt sorry for herself, which was a good thing. The problem was she never felt sorry for us either. <laughs> so there was never any excuse that you could make, you know, that was satisfactory to her. You know, she was always, you know, do you have a brain? And if the answer to that was yes, then you could have thought your way out of it. And uh, she would always quote the poem, yourself to blame. You're the captain of your ship. When things go awry, don't look for somebody else. You have we knew that was coming. So pretty soon, we just stopped making excuses and start looking for solutions. And I really think that that was the best thing that my mother did for us. But uh, she was so thrifty. You know, she would go to the Goodwill and buy a shirt, had a big hole in the elbow. 
buy two patches and put one on each elbow, people would be saying, where'd you get that shirt? I want one like it. And, and she knew how to stretch a dollar further than anybody. In fact, I'm convinced that if my mother were Secretary of Treasury, we would not be in a deficit situation <laughs> right now. But, uh, just, but her dream, her dream was to, to move back to Detroit and to be independent. And after a couple of years, we were in fact able to do that. Still in a multifamily dwelling, still with significant wildlife, but nevertheless, <laughs> You know, she was uh, independent, and I was in the fifth grade, I was a student. I was a horrible student. I was the worst student you have ever seen in your life. And, you know, I was called dummy, everybody called me stupid. I was the butt of every joke about anybody being dumb. And uh, I didn't like it, but I tried to act like it didn't bother me, but it really did. But I did have a way to get back at people. I was particularly good at one thing. That is getting other people kicked out of class. I was an expert <laughs> at doing that. Because see, I would study my classmates. I would figure out what made them really, really angry. And then I would just irritate them and irritate them until they were about to explode. But I would never push the last button to make them explode until we were in class and the teacher was nearby. And then I would do it, they would explode, the teacher would kick them out. I would say, yeah, man, this is great. <laughs> Because I wouldn't be the only one who didn't learn anything that day. But, uh, but see, there was this girl in our class, Miss Goody Two Shoes. You guys know who she is? Some of you were her, I'm sure. <laughs> Everything pristine, perfect, on time, made everybody else look like a total jerk. I said, wow, wouldn't it be great to get her kicked out of class? <laughs> there was only one problem. She was cool, calm, collected. You couldn't get under her skin. But I was persistent. I kept studying her. I finally figured out what it was that made her angry. Steam was coming out of her ears. She was about to explode. But I didn't push the last button. I waited till we were in the classroom. Lo and behold, she sat right down at the desk in front of me. I said, the Lord is good. <laughs> and uh, as the teacher approached, I began to irritate her. I pushed the last button. But she didn't explode. She just quietly turned around and said, you and me on the playground at recess. <laughs> so that didn't work out all that well. You know, I became a neurosurgeon and she became a professional wrestler. But, uh, <laughs> but I did stop bothering people after that. But you know, the, the kind of student that I was you know, it reminds me of, of many students that I encounter today. And worse than that, many adults that I encounter today who have such superficial knowledge, who don't know anything. I'm sure you remember some of those uh, jaywalking segments from the Jay Leno show, Man on the Street, or, or Jesse Waters. And they go out and they, they ask people just basic stuff. And they don't have a clue what the answer is. And this is a very dangerous situation. Because you see, the, the founders of our nation said that our system of government and our freedoms depend on a well-informed and educated populace. They said if we ever become other than that, the nature of the nation will change. Why? Because people would not have the wherewithal to analyze what they were being told and they could be easily manipulated by dishonest politicians and biased press. And we have to guard against that, which means we have got to once again begin to concentrate on being informed. You know, 20 to 30% of people who enter high school in this country now do not graduate. And this is the information age, the technological age. That wasn't such a bad thing during the agricultural age when we were known as the breadbasket of the world could produce more corn, wheat, and barley than anybody. Not a problem. Wasn't so bad during the industrial age 
where we could produce more airplanes and cars and sewing machines than anybody else. But we're no longer in the industrial age or the agricultural age. We're in, in the information age where knowledge is power. So we can't afford to have that number of people dropping out of high school. I was talking to the chairman of Intel. He said, we have a lot of high-powered, high-paying technical jobs. We cannot fill them with American college graduates. There aren't enough of them. We have to go to Japan and China and South Korea, India, to get people to fill these jobs. Think about that. And that says something about what we're doing or what we're not doing. And we really need to start paying attention to this and preparing for what comes up, not just reacting all the time to what happens, but anticipating and preparing ourselves. It will make a huge difference. But you know, it wasn't always like that in America. There was a time when we had the best public education system in the world. We were the envy of the world. Our people were well educated. In 1831, when Alexis de Tocqueville came to America to study this nation, because the Europeans were fascinated. They could not believe it. A fledgling nation, barely 50 years old, already competing with them on virtually every level. They had never seen anything like it before. There must be some fluke that Tocqueville was going to come here and ferret it out. So he said, I'm going to look at their government. He was duly impressed by our divided government and how efficiently it worked. Now this was a while ago. And then, uh, <laughs> and then he said, well, let me look at their education system. And he was really blown away. Anybody finishing the second grade was completely literate. I mean, he could find a beaver trapper on the outskirts of society and the guy could read the newspaper, could tell him how our government worked, could have a sophisticated conversation. Only the aristocracy in Europe were able to do that. And do you realize that that was really the reason that we had so many capable people who were able to move from one ocean to the other ocean against a rugged and hostile terrain? Because they knew how to build roads and structurally sound bridges and containment facilities and dams. They knew how to invent things when a problem came up. They were the epitome of the can-do attitude that characterized the rapid rise of America to the pinnacle of the world. That today is being replaced with the what can you do for me attitude, which is in the process of destroying our nation. And we have to make sure that we do not allow that to continue. Now, interesting. <laughs> if you really want to get an impression of how well educated our people used to be, take a look at the education chapter and our book before this book, which was America the Beautiful. And by the way, many of you probably read some of my previous books, Gifted Hands, Think Big, The Big Picture, Take the Risk, all of which became bestsellers. But I discovered the real secret with America the Beautiful and One Nation. Those two books I did with my wife. And they both became number one New York Times bestsellers. So that makes a difference. <laughs> and we actually just released a new ebook uh, last week called One Vote to help people understand the importance of becoming informed voters. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But if you look at the education chapter in America the Beautiful, we extracted questions from a middle school exit exam from the early to mid 1800s. What you had to know to get a middle school certificate in this country. I think you will rapidly realize 
that most college graduates today could not pass that test. We have dumbed things down to that level. And it is hurting us tremendously as a nation. And we all can benefit from more knowledge. You know, I like to challenge people to make a promise to themselves that for the next one year, they're going to spend a half an hour every day learning something new. Just a half an hour. Not much time at all. A lot of people spend that much time on the toilet. Take a book in there <laughs> with you, okay? And learn, and learn during that time. Half an hour. You know, it can be, it can be algebra, it can be uh, history, American history, uh, world history, physics. You know, there's a physics book called The Science Before Science by Dr. Anthony Rizzi. It's an easy to understand physics book. Uh, take a globe, spend a half an hour learning where different places are and what's around them. If you do that for one year, a half an hour, I guarantee you that people who don't know you, haven't seen you for a while, they'll say, who are you? <laughs> they'll think you've been possessed. I mean, you'll be so different. You'll know so much. And it's an easy thing to do. And it also sets a tremendous example for the young people in your sphere of influence. And, you know, it, translate, it translates into becoming a knowledgeable voter. You know, the average American, when they go into the voting booth, they're looking for a D, an R, or a name that looks familiar. The name could be Satan. Oh yeah, I know that name. <laughs> and in many cases it is, you know, and that is, that is problematic. And that's how we got into the situation that we're in now, where there is almost a total disconnect between the people and their representatives. And that is our fault. We, the people, are placed at the pinnacle of power in the way that our government was structured. But we cannot exercise that power unless we are knowledgeable. Now when you read the book, One Vote, which is easy to gain, and millions of copies are going to be available free of charge because it's so important to get people educated on this topic. And it will show you who your representatives are, how they voted, not how they said they voted, but how they actually voted. Um, you'll be able to determine their political philosophy and your political philosophy and see if they mesh. See if you're even in the right party. It's completely nonpartisan, but it helps people understand the process and what their vote means and why it is important. Because the way our, our country was designed for of and by the people, the people were supposed to be in control and the government was to conform to the people. We now have a people who conform to the government. It's completely out of whack, and it's up to us to turn it around back the way it's supposed to be. Well, you know, my, my mother fully understood the importance of knowledge. And she was sorely disappointed that I was such a bad student, and my brother was too, and she didn't know what to do, so she prayed. And she asked God to give her wisdom. And you know, he gave it to her, at least in her opinion. <laughs> My brother and I didn't think it was wise at all. I mean, turning off the TV, what kind of wisdom is that? And to make it worse, making us read two books apiece from the Detroit Public Libraries every week and submitting to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. And she would put <laughs> check marks and highlights and underlines and all these things. And we would think she was reading them, but she wasn't. But uh, I was disgusted. I mean, everybody else was outside playing and having a good time, and there I was in the house reading books. But an interesting thing began to happen. As I, as I read those books, 
I began to know things. I began to know things that other people didn't know. And I got excited. And I began to realize that the reason that I knew things is because I was reading the books. And I got to the point where if I had five minutes, I was reading a book. My mother would say, Benjamin, put the book down and eat your food. I was always reading within the space of a year and a half. I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class. Much to the consternation of all those students who used to laugh and call me dummy, who were now coming to me saying, Benny, Benny, how do you work this problem? And I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I will say. <laughs> Perhaps a little obnoxious. But it sure felt good to say that to those turkeys. But but what a difference it makes. And you know, it, it has to do with the tremendous gift that we were given by our creator. It's called the human brain. It is the most phenomenal organ system, not only on the earth, but in the universe. Your brain, billions and billions of neurons, Hundreds of billions of interconnections. Remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard. Can process more than two million bits of information in one second. You can't overload it. Some people say, don't learn this, don't learn that, you'll overload your brain. Take it from a neuroscientist. You cannot overload the human brain. If you learn one new fact every second, it would take you more than three million years to challenge the capacity of your brain. So no one here has anything to worry about at all. <laughs> that capacity can learn and learn. But when you think about learning and integrity and honesty, can you imagine what that combination can accomplish for us? That's what we have to begin to think about. And compassion. It's the reason that uh, my wife and I started the Carson Scholars Fund. We would go into schools, we would see all of these trophies. All-state basketball, all-state wrestling, all-state this, that, and the other. The quarterback was a big man on campus. What about the academic superstar? What did they get? National Honor Society pen, pat on the head, they're their little nerd. You know, nobody really cared about them. And that's one of the reasons that we're not competing well vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the developed world. And that's something that we have the ability to change if we really want to. So we started giving out scholar awards to students starting in the fourth grade from all backgrounds who achieved at exceptional academic levels and who cared about other people. Have to have both because we're trying to create the future leaders. And we don't need people who are just smart. Marquis de Sade was smart. Hitler was smart, but they weren't nice people. They didn't care about other individuals. And so we're trying to network all these students together. We started 17 years ago giving out scholarships, $1,000. Now I'll tell you, you give a fourth, fifth, sixth grader a thousand bucks, they automatically become big men on campus. Everybody is very interested in them. But they get money, it goes into a trust for them. They, every, they get an accounting each year. School gets a big trophy, every bit as impressive as any of the sports trophies. They get to wear a medal, they go to a banquet. We try to put them on the same kind of pedestal as the all-state uh, basketball player, the all-state wrestler. And uh, teachers have told us when we put a scholar in their classroom, the GPA of the whole class frequently goes up substantially over the next year. Because now, instead of this person being the nerd and the geek, there's somebody that's admired. And those are the kinds of things that we have to do. We also put in reading rooms, particularly in Title I schools, where kids come from homes with no books, they go to schools with no library. Those are the ones who drop out of school. Uh, but we put these reading rooms in. These are places that no little kid would pass up, the way they're decorated. And they get points for the amount of time they spend there, the number of books they read, and they can trade them in for prizes. In the beginning, they do it for the prizes, but it doesn't take long before that translates into much better academic performance. And if they develop a love for reading, it's 
almost impossible that they would be one of the ones who dropped out of school. And those are the kinds of things that we have to do in order to change what's going on in our society. And, and when you get home, take a look at it, carsonscholars.org. And we're all 50 states, and we have a lot of terrific scholars right here in California, incredibly smart people. But the other thing that I think is incredibly important is the development of that integrity in people. You know, we have a society now where we don't care that much whether somebody is being truthful and whether they're doing the right thing. And we say, what is the right thing? Almost like the Roman Empire before its fall, where you had these great learned men with the long flowing beards who could wax eloquently on every topic. Nothing was right, nothing was wrong, everything was relative and they lost their sense of who they were before their society crumbled from within. And there are lessons to be learned from that. Honesty makes a big difference. I remember when I was in college and um, I was completely broke. Had no money, not even bus fare to go to church. And uh, I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I don't have any money. And I was walking over by the bike rack in Battelle Chapel on the old campus of Yale University. And I looked down on the ground, and there was a $10 bill. And I said, praise the Lord. This is great. <laughs> well, a couple years later, I was in the same situation, not a dime. So I went over to the bike rack at Battelle Chapel. <laughs> Nothing there, but, but it, we had just had one of the final exams on one of my psych courses, and uh, an article had come up in a special edition of the uh, school newspaper saying that all of the final exams had inadvertently been incinerated, and that everybody was going to have to come back and retake the exam. And we all dutifully showed up, but it was a different exam. And it was incredibly difficult. But every question had some element in it that you recognized so that you thought that you were supposed to know the answer. But the professor left the room. And people started fouling out of the room, taking the exam with them. They were going to bone up on this stuff. And pretty soon, instead of 150 students, there were only 50 students, and then 25, and then 10, and then 5, and then 1. That one was yours truly. And into the room came a photographer and a newspaper editor and a professor to take the picture of the most honest student in class and to present me with a $10 bill. <laughs> so, so, honesty pays. There's no question about it. And you know, some years ago, I was, I was in the operating room and got a call from the university attorneys. And they said, the state of Florida is trying to attach your wages for child support. I said, what? I said, I have three children. I support them well. They said, no, there's a woman in Florida who says that you are the father of her son. And she knows where you went to high school college, medical school, internship, residency. She doesn't have a picture of you in scrubs. And I said, on the basis of that, I said, that's public information. Anybody can get that. On the basis of that, they were pursuing a paternity suit. And I had to get my lawyer involved. And then they said, <clears throat> send us a blood specimen. And we can do DNA testing. And I said, excuse me? I said, you people as incompetent as you are want me to send you a blood specimen? I say, it'll end up in a murder scene and I'll be in jail for the rest of my life. Are you kidding me? And then it escalated a little bit more. And then it just fizzled and it just disappeared. Because you see what happens is people see someone like me who's out and about a lot and they figure, They've been messing around. They don't even know all the people they've been messing around with, and they're going to want to keep it quiet, and they're just going to fork over the money. 
there was only one problem with their thinking. And that is, I knew that the only woman I'd ever slept with in my life was my wife. So I didn't have to scratch my head and say, was, was there a conference and, and, you know, I didn't have to do that, okay? And it makes a difference, it makes a difference. And that is not to condemn anybody who can't say that, because most people can't say that. But it is to say that we need to have lives that we're not ashamed of, and that we can look at through an open window, and not have to hide things, because then you're always worried about that tap on your shoulder. Remember that time? Remember what you did? When you don't have to worry about that tap on the shoulder, you can concentrate on what you're doing. I believe that that's the reason that God gave us rules and regulations. It wasn't because he was a control freak. It was because he wanted us to get the most out of our lives and not have to be constrained by all kinds of nefarious things happening in our lives and making it difficult for us to concentrate. Well, you know, I had a very rapid career in medicine. I found myself chief of pediatric neurosurgery uh, at age 33. Had a lot of controversy, a lot of controversial cases, uh, because I, I pushed the envelope a lot and did things that hadn't been done before. But they worked out. They all worked out extraordinarily well. But I think it prepared me for life after surgery, which turned out to be quite different than I thought. Uh, when I retired last year, I thought I was going to play golf. <laughs> and uh, I thought that I was going to learn how to play the organ. We bought this incredible organ, really nice. And I was going to learn new languages. We bought all these Rosetta Stones. <laughs> but uh, I think the good Lord had a different plan for me, starting with that prayer breakfast. And, uh, you know, it's just... It's, it's taken quite a different turn. And as I've thought about it, it wasn't something that I wanted to do, uh, go into public life, and particularly political life. And I still say, regardless of where I end up, I will never be a politician because I'm not going to do things that are politically expedient. I'm always going to do things that are right. And that's something that we have to come back to as a nation, realizing that there is such a thing as right and wrong, that there are values and principles that guide our lives. And the president has said that we're not a Judeo-Christian nation, but he doesn't get to decide that. We are the ones who get to decide that. It is our nation. And we have to use our collective intellect to solve the many problems that exist. You know, it started out with me with, with health care. And uh, it's funny, I was in the uh, airport a couple of weeks ago and a, a lady came and sat down next to me. She was African American. She says, I'm a Democrat. And she says, but I love all the stuff you say, but I just need to know one thing. Why don't you want poor people to have health care? And I said, let me straighten you out. <laughs> and uh, because what happens is, is there's so much propaganda out there. And in fact, you know, what I have proposed, a system of health savings accounts that are funded in a variety of different ways that is much cheaper than anything that we're doing now or anything that has to do with Obamacare. And it provides everybody in the country with care from birth to death and the same kind of care. There's not two levels of care. Everybody is valuable. And it also brings the whole healthcare system into the free market, which is what controls healthcare, quality and price. 
And I hope you'll take uh, time to look at it, saveourhealthcare.org, and see what's going on. Because I think you can't just complain about something. You have to actually put something in its place. And you can't just be against stuff. You have to be for stuff. And we have to use that intellect of ours to, to rectify the economy. You know, we have the most powerful economic engine the world has ever seen. But what have we done? Every week, dozens of new regulations around industry, business, academia. The government has reached a point where anybody who doesn't cooperate, you just pull the noose on them. You've got so many different regulations. This is not what America was supposed to be. And it's happened almost imperceptibly. We don't even realize what's going on in our nation. And we have a tax structure that is draconian. It's the, really one of the most ridiculous things anybody's ever seen. You think the health care bill is big. Our tax code is much bigger and much more complex than that. And it doesn't need to be. And, uh, we need to reform it. We have the highest corporate tax rates in the world. And we sit there and complain that people are doing things overseas, which indicates a fundamental misunderstanding of capitalism. People don't go into business to support the government. They go into business to make money. So a wise government creates a system that allows them to do that. That's what we have to think about. And we have to think about those who come behind us. I mean, $18 trillion? A national debt? Are you kidding me? I mean, that is such a staggering amount of money, most people can't even comprehend what it means. If you tried to pay that back at a rate of $10 million a day, it would take you 5,000 years. I mean, that is a staggering amount of money, and the only reason that we can do that is because we can print money. And the only reason we can print money is because our dollar is the reserve currency of the world. What if it wasn't? And some of you who, who know a little bit about world finances know that there are moves afoot right now to change that. And what happens if we can't print money with that level of debt? And that's just a, a small amount, a smidgen, as the president would say. That's a <laughs> small amount. Okay, <laughs> because the unfunded liabilities are much greater than that. And if we are no longer able to print money, we become a third world nation overnight. And that's one of the reasons that we the people have got to be smart. We have got to wake up. We cannot be lulled into a sense of false security by people telling us how good things are. Things are not good. We are on the brink of disaster. But we can fix it. And how do we fix it? By being smart enough to know who our elected officials are. And if they are people who keep voting to raise the debt ceiling and to jeopardize the future of our children, we need to throw them out of office. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. And we need to have the courage to stand for those who are coming behind us. Because the reason that we enjoy the freedoms and the prosperity that we have is because there were those who came before us who had courage. Nathan Hale, a teenage rebel, caught by the British, ready to be executed. He said, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. Patrick Henry, Give me liberty or give me death. All of those soldiers during World War II on D-Day, landing on the beaches of Normandy, being mowed down by the hundreds, by the thousands. But what did the others do? Did they turn back? No. They stepped over the bodies of their dead comrades and they overwhelmed the Axis forces, in many cases knowing that they would never see their beloved country or their loved ones again. Why were they willing to do that? They did it for you and for me so that we could be free. 
So now we have to ask the question, what are we willing to do for those who are coming behind us? Are we just going to go along to get along? Are we going to allow all the freedoms that were fought for to go away because we're afraid somebody is going to call us a name? Are we going to learn the meaning of the word sacrifice, that we don't have to have everything, that we can leave some things for them, that we don't have to spend up their future? Do we have the courage, the moral fiber to do that? I personally think that we do. I think about people like George Washington who rode alongside his men, didn't wait for a report. And I gotta tell you about something that you may not know. The AP American History course that's being taught across this nation right now, which was designed by the same guy who designed Common Core, by the way, um, it has like two paragraphs about George Washington, nothing about Dr. Martin Luther King, a huge section on slavery and how horrible we are, a huge section on Japanese internment camps and the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, how we killed people unnecessarily, a huge section on how we decimated the American Indians. I don't understand how any student taking that course could finish it and not immediately want to sign up for ISIS. You know, this is what we, <laughs> this is what we're doing. We're doing this in our nation. And the only way that it can stand is that we don't stand up and challenge this. We need to find out what's being taught to our students. We need to challenge the school board. We need to challenge whoever needs to be challenged, but we can't just sit around and allow our nation to be taken away from us. And that's exactly what's going to happen if we don't. Okay. And, and lastly, think about the War of 1812. And the British were winning that war, marching up and down the eastern seaboard, taking city after city taking Washington, D.C., burning down the White House. Next stop, the Inner Harbor, Baltimore, Fort McHenry, one of the last fortresses before we submitted. But General Armistead had a large American flag commissioned to fly in front of Fort McHenry. And when that British armada of ships came into the harbor, battleships as far as you could see. The admiral in charge was offended. He said, take that flag down. We are in control of this area. You have until dusk. And if you don't take that flag down, we will reduce you to ashes. There was a young amateur poet on board by the name of Francis Scott Key. He had a special mission from, General, from President Madison to try to get a captive physician released. He had overheard the British plan, so they weren't going to let him off the ship. And he sat there that evening, mourning for his beloved nation, knowing what was about to happen. And that flag was still flying as the sun went down and the bombardment started. Bombs bursting in air, missiles. It looked like the 4th of July. The sky was lit up dust and debris. He strained his eyes. He was trying to see, was the flag still there? Was the fort still there? He couldn't see anything. All night long it lasted. And finally at the break of dawn, he went out to the banister, straining, but all he could see was debris and smoke. And finally there was a clearing and he saw the most beautiful thing his eyes had ever behold. The torn and tattered stars and stripes still waving. And many historians say that that was the beginning of the turning of the tide of the battle of the War of 1812. And we went on to win that war and to retain our freedom. But if you'd gone into the grounds of Fort McHenry that day, you would have seen dead bodies of American soldiers who had died 
holding up that flag. They were not going to let that flag go down. That's courage. That's what has characterized America in the past. That courage is still here. And the next time you sing the national anthem, and you get to the end of that first stanza, and it says, land of the free, home of the brave. Don't just let those words roll off your tongue. But think about what they mean. And recognize that we cannot be free unless we're brave. Thank you. Well, we are out of time, as the clock says, but um, there's so many of you here, I know they have so many questions, we could stay all night, but why don't we take two questions from the audience, and if you have a question, raise your hand. Someone in the aisle will bring you a microphone. If you could just wait till the microphone is in your hand. Any questions at all for Dr. Carson? Okay, one right here. Two questions. I have two beautiful grandsons, and I thank this gentleman for serving our country. And I thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention, which I know this room is full of people that appreciate and know that in their heart. And I challenge all of you to go out to your neighbors and to your children and teach them to salute the flag, to say thank God bless America, and to teach their children the kind words that you just so beautifully and eloquently spoke tonight. Okay. And my question is, will you please run for president? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will tell you that uh, we have put together the, the USA First PAC uh, to raise money to help like-minded candidates, but also to put in place the infrastructure in case that decision is made. I'm waiting to see what happens in November. Uh, I think we're going to be very pleased. I think the, the pundits are going to be all scratching their heads and they're going to be wondering what just happened. But I think the American people are actually starting to wake up. And I'm pretty confident that God is not going to forsake this country and we're going to get it back. Um, share your direction and your recommendations about the dangers with Russia. The what? Russia. Putin and Russia. Oh, Putin and Russia. Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, I don't think you have to be very bright to understand what Putin is up to. <laughs> okay. You know, in 2008, he invaded Georgia and, and now Crimea and now eastern part of the Ukraine. And he's obviously trying to put the Soviet Union back together again, restart the Cold War. And we have to be smart enough not to just sit around and react to things that are happening. We have to be proactive. We need to be developing relationships with all the former components of the Soviet Union. We need to be strengthening NATO. We need to be getting them all involved with NATO, which will make it much more difficult for him. And we need to do what Ronald Reagan did. We need to fight him economically. Uh, where is most of his uh, resources coming from? Energy. Why? Because the European Union is dependent on him for energy. 
why don't we make them dependent on us for energy? We can do that. Um, and, and let me just conclude by saying this. In the pre-revolutionary days of America, people were so tired of the dictatorial style of King George III. And what did they do? They started getting together. They started having town meetings. They met in their barns. They even invited the loyalists. And they said, what kind of America do you want to have? What do you want to pass on to your children and to your grandchildren? And they encouraged each other. And that's how a ragtag bunch of militiamen was able to defeat the most powerful empire on earth. And we have to be willing to do the same thing today. We need to talk to the people in our spheres of influence. And there's a lot of people. In 2012, 93 million Americans did not vote. That's more than either candidate received. We have to get those people re-involved. Everybody has a sphere of influence. Talk to your uncle who hasn't voted in 20 years and your invalid aunt. And you know, if she can't get to the polling place, make sure you register her for an absentee ballot. And if she can't see, help her fill it out. There are all kinds of things that each one of us can do. We can multiply the effect that we have. And if we do that, no amount of fraud or abuse of the system will be enough to overcome the will of the American people.